created by Ian Livingstone, who is also responsible for the creation of the Grell, this creature is working hard to earn the ugliest creature in the Monster Manual Award. The Hook Horror is a horrible combination of a vulture, cockroach, bird, bone, and claws, and is one of the worst to ever come climbing out of the Underdark. Its appearance is enough to cause anyone to look on with disgust, just before it rips them apart with extreme violence. If you only focus on the looks of the monster, you might not be able to spot the true beauty of these creatures. And once we find that beauty, we'll share it with you. The Hook Horror first appears in The Fiend Factory in White Dwarf number 12. This is the same issue that introduces the Grell, the Gith Yankee, and several others that are best left behind, like the Assassin Bug or the Iron Pig. The Hook Horror then makes its official appearance in Dungeons and Dragons with the Fiend Folio. Nothing changes between the White Dwarf magazine and the Fiend Folio, with both describing a horrible monster no one would ever want to run into in a dark cave. Before we jump into its lore, we must take a moment to talk about its artwork. We know that making fun of the art in original Dungeons and Dragons is a bit like cheating, but the Hook Horror is in a class all of its own. They are described as a large, powerful, two-legged creature with a vulture's head and a hard-bladed exoskeleton with mottled gray fur. While this is a wonderful description, it doesn't do the creature's appearance enough justice as the art presents a strange amalgamation of a teenager trapped in a bird's body. Its entire upper body looks like an acne-covered breastplate with powerful arms and legs just poking out from this horrible Halloween costume. Its arms end in pirate hook hands with tassels around the wrists, its feet strange discount monster claws, and its head seems to be a big bird reject. Of course, your players will probably stop laughing at this foul creature when they realize the danger they are in. Their upper body breastplate exoskeleton gives them a solid armor class of 3, which is pretty good as most of the other creatures have anywhere from 4 to 7. It gets better for the hook horror because you might end up fighting up to 12 of these creatures at a time, which probably ends up with you turning into a pincushion for hooks. Not only do you have to worry about its hooks, but its face is one only a mother could love, and we'd imagine its beak can be quite powerful, even if it doesn't use it in a normal fight, but to tear bits of meat off you when your allies abandon you only to be devoured by the hook or. If you want to avoid ever meeting these creatures, stay above ground, as they live deep underground where they wander through dungeon corridors and chambers. They have poor eyesight, but they make up for it having an acute sense of hearing, and they are incredibly hard to sneak up on and surprise as a result. Strangely enough, the hook horror is mute and can't crow, squawk, or make any voices. Instead, it communicates through a system of bizarre clicks and clacks with its exoskeleton, which is quite eerie. If you do happen to be wandering a dungeon and hear clicking noises, either your teeth are chattering in fear or hook horror is just informing you of your soon-to-be demise. While the hook horror survives through the additions in Dungeons & Dragons, it might have been a near thing as it was personally called out by Ed Greenwood in Dragon Magazine number 55. In the article Fiend Folio Findings, a flat taste that didn't go away, Greenwood expresses his unhappiness with many of the creatures found in the Fiend Folio, and specifically states that the hook horror only has its ugly appearance going for it. He does soften his stance a bit later in the article, though states that its development needs more work. At this point, we can only assume that the hook horror is in tears, and for good reason as it must wait 79 issues of Dragon Magazine before it finally gets its time in the sun. In Dragon Magazine number 131, the Hook Horror is featured in The Ecology of the Hook Horror, written by Michael Persinger, and we suppose that Ed Greenwood wasn't interested in thinking too much about this poor hideous creature. The story is told by the scholar Ferba, writing to the assembled guild of naturalists of Cordelof City. It's written in a matter-of-fact scientific format, providing a trove of information, old and new, about our misshapen friend. The Hook Horror still hides its grotesque form and resides in underground layers and caverns. It roams these places not by sight, but by hearing, and is so adept that it is almost like it can see through its hearing. It also has a super sniffer on top of it all to help it pick up the scent of nearby creatures. It can't be easy for these 9 foot tall creatures. They shuffle around in the darkness with the speed of a sleepy baby bear, but they nap a lot too, as maintaining their energy level can be quite a challenge. Why are these creatures so into taking naps? Ferber explains that the hook horror is quite the eater as they need large quantities of food to survive for their large bulk. To make even matters harder on them, they are herbivores and only seek the destruction and the consumption of all plant life. So we finally have a creature whose sole goal in life isn't to eat the flesh off your bones. Some of these horrors have even learned to plant and grow their own moss, helping to sustain them. 
This is great news for all adventurers. You can finally put away those swords. But what if you want your own hookor? Well, hookor is reproduced by laying eggs once a year. These eggs have the appearance of common rocks and stones, providing them with a natural camouflage against creatures looking for a good source of protein for their breakfast. While a newborn hookor starts small, only being one foot tall, they grow quickly. By the end of their first year, they grow to five feet tall and reach a maximum of nine feet when they are 17. Like most children, they are stubbornly independent, moving out by the age of three and start looking to make babies by the age of six. Once a mate is found, they probably settle down in one of the small Hukora clans and start building a family of their own. Though if you do happen to raise a Hukora, they aren't very good pets as they just follow around whoever gives them the most food. If you try to train them to protect an area, they can be easily bribed with a nice Caesar salad. One of the creepier things you might stumble across in the subterranean tunnels is the massive chitinous plates that these Hukors have shed. As they grow in size, their exoskeletons don't, so they must go through a molting process. They shed their plating for several days, which reveals an already developed exoskeleton that is strong enough to support their weight reduces their AC to only a 5. After a few days, these new exoskeletons harden and the hook aura is back to being armored like a tank. These creatures are so well known for their armor that it is coveted by armorists and blacksmiths alike as it can be crafted into a large suit of armor that can fetch up to 450 gold pieces. Of course, you better stand 9 feet tall if you hope to use a fully matured hook horror exoskeleton as your armor. The hook horror must wait quite a while before appearing in the basic edition of Dungeons & Dragons, finally appearing in the Mistara campaign setting adventure XL1 Quest for the Heartstone, released in 1984. This adventure is best known for being rather lackluster and as a thinly veiled attempt at selling monster figurines produced by TSR, the parent company of Dungeons and Dragons. Luckily, it isn't all bad as it does include the hook horror and has better artwork for it. While nothing changes for the creature, we can at least see that the artwork has made this creature far more ferocious with a few strange changes. It now has some sort of weird bare feet claws, its head is rather large and vaguely shaped like the cross between a hippo and a vulture, and it doesn't really have chitinous plates, but appears more like flesh with more warts than a green hat. They were added in this adventure as just another hazard, along with basilisks, floor traps, and even a black pudding for dessert. Finally, this adventure informs you that you should buy the Hook Corp monster produced by LJN Toys, though we disagree, it is quite an ugly figurine. Not all is lost for this edition, as the Hook Horror appears in two more books with the Creature Catalog, released in 1986, and the Creature Catalog, released in 1993. These two books share similar information, with the 1993 Creature Catalog merely being an updated version of the 1986 book. These two books contain most of the monsters that have appeared in the basic Dungeons & Dragons modules, like Quest for the Hearthstone, and also introduces a few new monsters. The Hook Horror makes it showing in the Monsters category and is now a specific version of a Hook Beast. A Hook Beast is, as the name suggests, used to refer to bipedal monsters with hooks for hands, though only two monsters truly fall under this classification. The Hook Horror and the Hulker, which is just a depowered version of the Umber Hulk. These two monsters are often found working together with the Hulker leading groups of Hook Horrors on hunting raids where they hunt for humanoid flesh. Both creatures love the taste of flesh and attack humanoids on sight, so we guess that the hook horror's plant-based diet isn't going as well as we would like. While there is a change in diet for these creatures, there's also a change in beauty. The hook horror now has a face that even a mother couldn't love as it appears as they ran face first into a gelatinous cube. We can't tell from the artwork if it has a beak or if its mouth is just grotesque flesh dripping with saliva. To call this creature ugly may just be the understatement of the century. In 2E, the first appearance of the Hook Horror is in the monstrous compendium Greyhawk Adventures Appendix from 1990 and is later reprinted in the Monstrous Manual from 1993. While the descriptions are the same between the two books, the picture found in the Monstrous Manual is quite different, and some may call it even uglier. It's a skinny insect creature with insectoid arms and a shell that looks like it belongs to a beetle or roach. Its back has a long spike-like protrusion running down it, and its eyes reflect that the creature is mostly blind, being milky gray with no pupils. This version of the hook horror probably comes the closest to the horrifying humanoid insectoid that might have been originally imagined, and it fits the lore the closest, as they are now distantly related to the cockroach and the cave cricket. 
very distantly. While they lack the capacity to see, they are great at smelling and hearing their prey, and they aren't affected by blindness, although if you cast a silent spell on them, you pretty much neutralize them as a threat. In addition, they communicate through clicking noises that emanate from the exoskeleton around their throats, and that communication can echo through miles and miles of caves and tunnels. This language also has another ability, beyond calling in reinforcements to rip your throat out, as it is now used as a type of sonar. They can make clicks and chirps in a cavern, and, with the sound bouncing off of every rock wall and stone, can determine the entire shape of the chamber like they are daredevil. The creature's ecology changes yet again, and now they are back to feasting on their veggies, though they prefer devouring meat. It's a bit better than the basic version, where they just ate meat, but still, it just means that you have one more thing to worry about when you travel through the caves and tunnels of your adventuring. Of course, you could always try and eat them by hunting them down. If you decide to fight these creatures, good luck surprising them, as there is only a 10% chance of that working. So, let's assume you failed, and now you have to deal with an angry and hungry hook horror bearing down on you with its hooks and beak. It attacks twice with its hooks, one for each arm, and then if they both hit, it goes in for a kiss and pecks at you with its beak. It automatically hits you with the beak attack, dealing 1d12 damage. It then holds on to you for every round after that, and it gets to peck you to death until one of its hooks is dislodged. Of course, if you do dislodge it and somehow push it back, it can easily escape by clambering up walls, using its powerful hooks to give it a fast climbing speed and scurry up cliffs, walls, and more. The good news is that they can't climb on the ceiling, since they are 9 feet tall and weigh over 350 pounds. While it's little comfort, at least you don't have to focus on the ceiling as much. This edition also provides greater insights into the hook horrors and their ecology. We'll start with the question everyone has on their mind. Hook horrors reproduce by the females laying eggs, and all the eggs are placed in the safest place inside the cavern complex that the hook horror clan has claimed. The clan is ruled over by the oldest female and is protected by the oldest male, who is also in charge of hunting and acts as the war chieftain if the clan is attacked. But who on earth would ever try to attack a clan of hook horrors? Adventurers may think they have treasure, but they don't because they have no hands to pick up treasure with, only their beaks. This makes it quite hard to do any real looting when you can only carry back a single item at a time. What hook horrors are protecting against are any natural predators they may have, though there aren't many. Perhaps some drow think that they would make wonderful pets, although we don't agree. They also protect against other clans of hook horrors, though conflict isn't common as they typically stick to themselves and clans don't bother claiming large swaths of territory. Hook horrors, though, are quite territorial and take anyone intruding onto their small spot of a cave as an attack against all of their clan and have no problem clicking and clacking about how they are going to rip you apart. While these strange insectoid creatures don't get much love, they do appear in a few different places. In Treasures of Greyhawk from 1992, the hook horrors have fallen in with some bad people and act as bodyguards for the beholder Zomatil, who uses his charm monster eye ray to keep them in check. In Flames of the Falcon from 1993, this Greyhawk adventure pits you against an entire clan of hook horrors, and then, well, that's all. You just march up to their home, they attempt to protect it, you massacre not just the men horrors, but the women horrors and the children horrors, and continue your murderous jaunt through the underground caverns. This cycle of just monsters to be killed continues in every adventure that features them. In The Witch's Fiddle, an adventure in Dungeon Magazine number 54, the hook horrors are just there to kill an NPC or be killed by the party. In The Night Below from 1995, hook horrors are just a roadblock as the party is trying to unravel a mystery that will eventually land them in an abolith city deep in the Underdark. Warlock of the Stone Crowns from 1995 at least features the hook horrors with a twist as their minds are being taken over by a strange yellow fungus, causing them to become even more violent than normal. Many other adventures have hook horrors, though they are merely creatures to be killed and their experience points to be counted. It's not until the third edition Monster Manual 2, released in 2002, that we encounter the hook horror. The appearance of these monsters continue to deteriorate into the bizarre, which is pretty hard to imagine. 
While they still have the head of a vulture, they now come with red-rimmed eyes, giant humanoid upper arms that end in a single pincer of a crab arm, and its feet are strange three- and four-toed abominations. Its upper body is kind of like an exoskeleton, but they have a six-pack and their chest looks quite muscular, though they do have what appears to be a hard shell and codpiece, so they are armored, we guess. The ecology of these creatures is condensed into a single paragraph that calls them sly, fierce, and territorial. Not bad descriptors, especially since some of our favorites in the past are more often than not insulted in this edition. The strangest thing to come out of this edition is that while they keep their echolocation, in this edition it is simply called Blindsight, and they now become sensitive to the light. This wasn't the case in the past editions, and each edition talked about how the light didn't bother them since their vision was so horrible. Maybe these horrible hooked creatures finally got a chance to see the optometrist. Clans are still important, they still lay eggs, and the oldest female still rules with a chitinous hook. Males are still the hunters and warriors, and they'll protect their territory to the last. In addition, if you do try to gain them as your allies, you don't have to learn how to speak exoskeleton click clack. Instead, you can just talk to them in undercommon, which makes it so much easier to explain to them that you don't taste very good and you should eat the dro first. This probably gets you a bonus for your persuasion attempt, as they think dro is delicious and is their preferred meal. The horrible hook continues the tradition of appearing in a bunch of places, but not getting a huge amount to do. They get a brief mention in Lords of Madness, released in 2005, where it is revealed, in two sentences, that they may have been created by archmages who use them as servants. We aren't sure how good of butlers and maids they can be, since they are lacking the ability to open doors or open a bottle of wine, but we can imagine they were quite good at tearing their creators to shreds with their massive hooks. If you are hoping for something new for our favorite hook-handed monsters, the adventure Expedition to the Ruins of Greyhawk, released in 2007, has got your monster. This adventure utilizes a template found in Monster Manual 3, released in 2002, The Void Mind, which is basically what happens when a mind flare throws up in your skull after partially eating your mind. This throw up in the mind is a psionic green goo that turns the creature the mind flare was lightly snacking on into a mindless minion with a few aberrant tendencies. In this adventure, some mind flayers create the Void Mind Hook Horror, who can shoot out a sentient tentacle that can eject slime, grab onto you, and begin constricting you like a snake. In the fourth edition, these strange insect monsters make their way into the Monster Manual from 2008, and, while we can't say they're cute, they have definitely become quite terrifying and fully evolved into their artwork. They are a bluish black color, the hooks remain extra long, and they look like a bird cockroach combination. They reside in the Underdark, return to clicking as their only form of communication, and use the echolation ability that comes with this clicking sound. You'll still find them in clans, their clan leader is still female, though now the criteria for being a boss is that you are the best at laying eggs. They love meat, and Dro remains their favorite anytime snack. If you find yourself getting charged by a hook horror or 12, you may have a few things to worry about. They like to climb up high and jump down, ambushing their prey in a blur of hooks and beak. If they get the chance, they'll attack with both their hooks, ripping into their target, dealing extra damage, and grappling their squirming meal. They can either then bite you with their beak or fling you aside if you are a bit too difficult to properly eat and kill. If you are hoping for a few new hook horrors, this edition is loaded up with several to throw at your players. In the adventure from the Demon Queen's Enclave from 2008, the rotting hook horror barrels in, ripping apart any living creature with its ferocious hooks. It's an undead creature and is basically a normal hook horror, but now it deals necrotic damage when it hits and causes you to be slowed if it beaks you. The Shadow Hook Horror appears in Dungeon Magazine number 163, and if you had thought jumping down from the ceiling was bad, these creatures lurk within the shadows, becoming invisible until they spring out to rip you apart. Things get weird in Underdark from 2010, with the introduction of the Hook Horror Dark Fiend. These horrible beasts are kept as the pets of Cyclops, and while they still have the massive claws they are known for, they can summon forth zones of darkness, let loose horrific shrieks that deafen, and even leap great distances where they pounce and rip a creature apart. Of course, maybe you are wanting something ancient, like the Elder Hook Horror showcased in Dungeon Magazine number 204. These horror beasts have fast reflexes, capable of grabbing people when they try to run away and tearing them apart with relish. 
In addition to a few variants, there is also a bit of information on the creation of the hook horror mentioned, quite briefly, in the article Deities and Demigods, Torog the King That Crawls, from Dungeon Magazine number 177. This article talks about the Order of Emma Malagon, a cult to honor the god Torag, the king that crawls, who can be found crawling through the Underdark. The best way the cult honors Torag is by grafting and creating horrible aberrations and releasing them into the wild to augment and invade the natural world. One such experiment, which we think went horribly wrong, is the entity known as the Hook Horror, which we can only imagine and hope murdered its creator and devoured them. Serves them right for making this horrible creature. Appearing in the 5th edition Monster Manual, released in 2014, the Hook Horror has little to show for th in this edition. While they make it into the main book of monsters for this edition, they do so as a measly CR3 creature, a drastic fall in power from the previous editions, or as a force to reckon with. Little even changes for their ecology or background, they are just murderous monsters who reside in subterranean terrain, waiting patiently on the ceilings ready for a morsel to walk under them. These creatures retain a hardened exoskeleton with bony protrusions, hooks for hands, a shell and codpiece, and a vulture-like head. They are kind of purplish-blue and even have whiskers like a cat, probably because of their eyesight, though they have dark vision up to 120 feet away, so maybe their eyesight is better than we thought. They still use their exoskeleton to communicate and even have their own language known as hook horror. They use their hooks, tapping on their bone protrusions and exoskeleton to send their communications through caverns and tunnels creating a creepy click and clack that echoes for miles and miles. If you do find a hook horror, or rather it finds you, know that they are still in clans with the oldest female in charge with her mate as the one in charge of all hunters. They work together in the groups, hunting down fungi, plants, and of course, you. Few mentions of the hook horror make their way into this edition, though a mated pair of horrible creatures can be found running from a group of gnolls who are chasing them in the adventure Out of the Abyss, released in 2015. If you are skilled enough, you might even find where they are keeping their hook horror eggs, and a just hatched hook horror imprints on the first creature it sees, which could be you if you are unlucky enough. In addition, they appear as an ambush encounter in Waterdeep Dungeons and the Bad Mage, released in 2018, but can be quickly dealt with and no other thought is given to them. Just the description of these creatures is enough to help you imagine how dangerous and weird these creatures are. Massive hooked claws, a vulture's beak, roach midsection, and a rock-hard exoskeleton with bones sticking out from the side all combine into a strange amalgamation. You wouldn't be wrong to immediately think you are as good as dead, but it can be defeated if you are smart enough to stay away from its claws and sacrifice your allies. If you ever do find yourself walking through subterranean tunnels and hear clicks and clacks echoing across the stone, keep your head on a swivel as you search for the ugliest 9-foot monster you could ever imagine. <laughs> 